Well, I want to welcome you to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And uh, whenever we enter the Word of God, we always want to do it with prayer. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for your Spirit. And we invite you, Father, to just come into this study and guide us. Open our hearts and lives to the truths that you have here for us. We pray, Father, that you would just help us to more fully understand the extremes that you've gone to on our behalf as we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Savior indeed. Amen. Okay, well we are in the 18th session of 20. This is on chapter 19, if you will. And of course it will deal with the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, now... Last time we met, we went through chapter 18. We reviewed superficially the six trials that he was exposed to, three Jewish and three Roman. And uh, we discovered that he was actually declared numerous times by Pilate as being innocent. So as the legal advocate there, he should have released him at that time, but he was, in effect, uh, frightened by the threats of an insurrection. And uh, he discovered he was a Galilean, so he sent him to Herod. We didn't cover that last time. That was in Luke, and we just uh, summarized that as we went by. But when uh, Pilate discovered he was from Galilee, he thought that he could hand this all off to Herod, but Herod was more slippery than that. And so, uh, but we're going to explore now, tonight, in chapter 19, the most significant event in the history of the universe. And... Uh, it's no less than that. It very much is very, it very much is that. So Christ is now before Pilate, and the first 15 verses are going to focus on that. And he just, again he will declare Jesus innocent by by, but he's going to be coming very very uptight, very nervous over this whole issue. And the power in the hands of a small man is always dangerous. So verse 1 of chapter 19, Then Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him. And um, I assume his motive was to try to engage the sympathy of the crowd. Scourged, by the way, without cause, was illegal. It was illegal under Roman law. This was because he was before sentencing. And so he had intended to chastise and then release him, uh, probably uh, preying on the the, uh, sympathy of the crowd. Now, this question of scourging it may be far more serious than you and I have been taught because this idea of a limit of 39 lashes was a Hebrew limit. The Romans did not have such a limit. And they often used rods and what have you. And uh, to give you just a hint at the severity, you know that he couldn't bear the cross. And Luke covers that, where Cyrus Sinai was recruited to take the cross for him because he couldn't handle it. But the main point is we discover, especially from the descriptions of this in the Old Testament, that he was tortured beyond human recognition. And the last verse of Isaiah 52 puts it just that way. Even the King James is translated softly to the the, the actual phrasing is literally that, that he could not be recognized as a son of a man. But the soldiers then planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put on a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they, of course, are doing this in mockery, if you will. And they smote them with their hands. Hail, King of the Jews. Now, the crown of thorns, why the crown of thorns? Well, that's actually an echo, if you will, from Genesis chapter 3, when as a result of Adam's sin, the uh, thorns were a symbol of the curse that God pronounces and how appropriate it is for the last Adam to be bearing those thorns on his brow as, in a sense, closing that metaphor from Genesis chapter 3. And uh, even the, uh, the, the very uh, image of God that attracted Moses there in Midian 
was that thorn bush on fire but not being consumed. And that's an interesting uh, metaphor or idiom, if you will, for God himself. And uh, burning but not giving some model of his mercy, if you will. So as you study your Bible, the more you know about your Bible, the more these little subtleties in Genesis will leap out at you as uh, anticipatory echoes of the climax that occurs later. Many people would regard this as Satan's hour in the sense that this is when the, the uh, seed of the serpent is bruising the, the seed of the woman. But he is going to crush his head, of course. When he says, Hail, kings of the Jews, that, that is actually the greeting they use for Caesar. And, of course, they are mocking when they do that. Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. What an astonishing statement. Because he is the judge, and he should have that point, at that point released him. But the Jewish leadership threatened that they would report to Caesar that he's no friend of Caesar's. And that, that has him terrified. He went forth again. Now, you see, you need to understand that the, the Jews refused to enter the praetorium because that was Gentile land. They couldn't. So he's meeting them at the boundary. So he will go within that. He'll talk to Jesus. But then outside, he'll address the crowd. And uh, so he went forth again. In other words, he's stepping outside into the public light. And... Uh, but again, he pronounces him innocent, and the charges should have been dismissed. And uh, he was back uh, in Isaiah, it predicted that, that he would no find, find no fault in him. Judas declared him innocent in Matthew 27. I have, in, de, I have betrayed innocent blood, he declares. Pilate here says, I, I found no fault in him. He says that again and again. Herod said, uh, uh, he said to Herod by Pilate under the same conditions. Pilate's wife had dreams and was warning him to to uh, let go of this whole thing. Even the dying thief on the cross, we'll discover, uh, 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 announced his innocence. And the Roman centurion, of course, does at the end too. Truly, this man was the son of God, he declares. Well, Jesus came forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto him, to them, Behold the man. I'm assuming that he was hoping that that would enlist their sympathy and, and he could play on that. And uh, Antonio Cesare's uh, uh, painting is famous for this, Echo Homo. He did it in 1871. And it's a really, I think it's an excellent piece of art. It really captures the flavor of the moment. Ecce Homo, behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. In other words, he just hands him over to his enemies. It's the leadership there that cried out, Crucify him. They apparently had bribed the mob, too, to get a, a mob uprising flavor here. And uh, the uh, Crucify him. It's aorist imperative with no stated object. This is like fans in a stadium following cheerleaders. It's just a mob reaction here. And again, again, he, proclaim, he proclaims him innocent. And uh, the Jews' charge of king is not taken seriously, you know. And uh, so the Jews answered and said, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. You know, I'm fascinated by this statement because you have many people say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Anyone that says that hasn't read the Bible. Not only did he declare that, but that's the accusation they put against him to kill him. That he made himself the Son of God, indeed. Blasphemy was the real reason. And that's, of course, in the Torah as such. So Pilate was given actually three warnings. The good witness of Christ himself, as Paul points out in his first letter to Timothy the dream of his wife, which was called to his attention by his wife. And the real motive of the Sanhedrin was revealed. He knew he was set up for envy. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Why would he be more afraid? See, to a pagan leader, the God-man possibility required investigation. Greek and Roman mythology was filled with accounts 
of God's living among men. So within his own belief structure, that was something that obviously disturbed him. And he went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Where did you really come from? He's concerned. But Jesus gave him no answer. Why did he give him no answer? Because he hadn't taken advantage of the truth he'd already been given. There's a principle there that Jesus announces even to his disciples. Whence art thou? Who are, where are you from, really? And of course, fear is here, and this is the sixth of his seven questions. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? And Jesus explained it to him a little more clearly. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Wow. See, and, and so this is his last official testimony before being crucified. And of course it was predetermined, as is pointed out all through the book of Acts in a number of places. See, God's counsels do not relieve the guilt of the men who execute them. So Judas is held accountable for what he did, even though it had been predicted, and so on. It's interesting to me, as I watch this administrator struggle with his predicament, Pilate seeks every means he could think of to release Jesus. But he had to choose between Christ and the world. And he had sought to release him, but couldn't find a mechanic that would work for him. Jesus' trial before Pilate took place in seven stages. He was outside at first, then inside, then again outside, then inside, then outside and inside, and finally outside again in this chapter. It's interesting to me that he's, he's really struggling with this. And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him, it says in verse 12. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not... Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. That's a very clever strategy on the part of the Jewish leadership. Not Caesar's friend. That's an appellation that Pilate could not afford to have said against him in Rome. Thou art not Caesar's friend. That To a, to a, a Roman leader, uh, that was the kiss of death. His, he should have a totally unclouded allegiance to Caesar if he's going to get anywhere. And for them to try to, to make that accusation terrified Pilate. So he had to choose between the world and Christ. Don't we all? Now, um, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called in the pavement, but in Hebrew, the Gabbatha. And this is the only uh, other mention uh, of the Hebrew equivalent, uh, was in Ahaz's surrender in abject apostasy in 2 Kings 16. It's the only place these things are mentioned. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith to the Jews, Behold your king. I think this is rather fascinating, is that the personal representative of the rule of the world is presenting Jesus to the crowd as their king. And... Um, there's an element of mockery here, perhaps, but at the same time, a very interesting statement. And uh, it was the preparation of the Passover. Now, we've got to be careful with this, because it's very confusing. The term Passover is used connotatively of the whole holiday period of the, of the spring. Because you've got Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. These three feasts are collected under the, the, the overall label of Passover used connotatively. What is actually the preparation day for the, the main Sabbath that's the next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Passover is uh, uh, denotatively is always the 14th of Nisan. And the next day, the 15th of Nisan, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's a high day, and it's celebrated actually for seven days. And, uh, but anyway, it was the preparation of the, of, for that feast, about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And so uh, I find it fascinating to see Pilate declaring Christ's kingship to the, to the, to the mob. And it continue, in, Mark, in Mark, by the way, the reference is a little clearer. 
And now when even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. Now when it says Sabbath there, it's not talking about Saturday, it's talking about the Sabbath, the high Sabbath. In addition to the 52 Saturdays in a year, you also had seven additional high Sabbaths, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was one of those. And so when we think of Sabbath, most of us as Gentiles say, well, you must mean Saturday. No, not necessarily. There are 52 Saturdays in a year, but there's also seven additional high Sabbath, Sabbatons. And that's what they're getting ready for. And uh, so the, uh, it's clear that the crucifixion could not have occurred on a Friday. That's a church tradition that started very early in an in a, in a atmosphere of anti-Semitism. We know that uh, Jesus himself in Matthew 12, verse 40, said, Just as Jonah was spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Well, you don't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday, no matter how you try to twist things. People have tried to, to rationalize that. You can't do it. Furthermore, Matthew 28, verse 1 has a mistranslation in it. It, it's act, the word Sabbath there is in the plural in the Greek. And the only place I've seen that caught, because I call it to their attention, frankly, was the International Standard Version Bible. Because they too had missed it until they looked more carefully. The word Sabbath is plural in Matthew 20. When the Sabbaths were passed, plural. That's profoundly important. But also in John chapter 12, you may recall that Jesus made a trip from Jericho um, six days before the Sabbath, which means that could not have been on a, on a, on a Sabbath day. Um, so, uh, uh, six days before the Passover, I should say. So anyway, moving on. Verse 15, But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Wow, that's probably the only time in their existence that they exceeded that, because they hated Caesar, they hated the Roman rule. And I'm, I'm sure it came as a surprise to Pilate's ears to have that leadership, the chief priests, say, we have no king but Caesar. It's obviously a politically correct term that's very distant from where their hearts are, of course. But uh, this is probably the only time in their lives they, they resented Rome. So this is the official denial of the king of the Jews. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. As a lamb to the slaughter, literally. That's the way it's described by Isaiah. And that's exactly, he is the lamb. I was very fascinated this weekend. I was talking to a Chinese translator. And the symbol in Chinese for righteousness is a term that has judgment and over it is a lamb. And that's interesting because they don't venerate lambs particularly, but that idiom is one of the many of ancient Chinese that makes no sense unless you know Genesis chapter 3. It's, it's a, there's a whole study there you can look into. And so they delivered them, therefore, and the word there is to be given over to the side, if you will. Delivered, yielded him, is another way we might say it. And this is where in, the, in Matthew it points out, Pilate ceremonially washes his hands of the whole deal. And uh, so, see, from the standpoint of Satan, this was both a triumph and also a defeat. It was a triumph for Satan to bruise the heel of the woman's seed as had been foretold in Genesis 3.15 when God declares war on Satan. A put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt uh, 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 crush your head and it will bruise his heel. In other words, Satan was to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Which the seed of the woman is a title of the Messiah. The seed of Satan is a lesser known but a very valid title of the Antichrist. There was a seed of a woman, and that's before us here in this, this chapter. The seed of Satan is going to emerge in our near history. It was a defeat, though on the other hand, because the head of Satan is yet to be crushed and will. 
Because Hebrews 2.14 makes that clear, that, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. If you have any confusion about that, Paul straightens it out, straightens it out in the second chapter of Hebrews. So let's stand back a little bit and take a look at the order of events here. John 19 will show him carrying his cross. Then Simon from Cyrene is substituted because he stumbles with it. Then he's offered a stupefying drink, which the first time he, denies, he, he refuses it. He's then nailed between two thieves, and we'll look at that here shortly. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that gives rise to those that really want to study the city of refuge model in the Torah. Some interesting lessons come out of that. The Jews then mock Jesus. If he was the son of God, let him, bring, let him come down from there and so forth. And one of the other thieves rails at him, but the other thief receives salvation because he acknowledges his innocence. I mean, the innocence of Christ. And he, and he gets the promise from Christ. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's all covered in Luke rather than John, but it's all there. And one of the things I think I've advocated you do, as we go, especially as we go through, through these chapters in John, is to parallel the chapters with the chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because each of them have a slightly different perspective. They don't contradict each other, but they clearly have a different emphasis. And one way you get the whole picture is to read the parallel accounts. But we're going to encounter him saying, hey, Behold thy son, where, where he, he uh, 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 announces that to Mary, and then uh, assigns the custody of his mother to John the Apostle. A surprising move because he had four brothers. But he assigns her care to the Apostle John. Which he, and, and from that day on, John takes her under wing, and she, reti she retires with him to, to uh, ultimately to Ephesus. Then comes the darkness that could be felt, and then Jesus claims out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Deliberately quoting the opening line of Psalm 22. And the other thing that you were supposed to do in preparation for this hour was to read Psalm 22, and one of the discoveries you'll make, it reads as if it was dictated first person singular while he hung on the cross. It opens and closes with his opening and closing statements. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Opens it, and at the very end, there's the equivalent statement of saying it is finished. Then he finally does declare he's thirsty, he's dehydrated, and he, he makes that claim, and we'll look at that here in a minute. And he finally declares a very, a one-word thing in the Greek, the way it's recorded. It is finished, is the way it's translated in John 19.30. But an equivalent translation is paid in full. When you play, paid your bill to a merchant, and it was billed, he would write across it to telestai, paid in full. And that's what Jesus declares as his final, that his work is finished. And so we'll take a look at all of that as we go. Because his Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He gave his life. They didn't take it from him, he gave it. And so he dismisses his spirit, as we will see in 1930. So let's just pick up the narrative, that's the order. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. That confuses a lot of people because it depends what language you're looking at here. In Hebrew, it's Golgotha, and uh, it's the location that we encounter in the Akedah in Genesis 22, when Abraham offers Isaac, as God had told him to. And Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy in advance, because he names the place in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And of course, at the very last minute, there's a substitution of a ram. But it's interesting to understand that Abraham knew that if he offered Isaac at that offering, that Isaac would be returned to him, because God had promised that Isaac would have children. And so from Abraham's point of view, if you want me to offer him, God, you've got a problem I don't have. You'll have to raise him from the dead. That's his mindset. And that's not contrived. That's exactly what Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. So we need to understand as we read chapter 22 that there is a, an acting out of prophecy because on that very spot, 2,000 years later, another father would offer his son as a lamb. And uh, so, now in the Greek, 
That place is called the Cranian or Latin, the Calvaria. It's, those are words for the skull, if you will. And uh, so the, it's outside the gate, according to Hebrews 13.12. It's without the camp as required in the Torah in Leviticus 16. And uh, if you're there today you, and you stand across, it's actually the site of a bus station, so it's noisy and strange. But up on that wall, you can be, even with all the erosion over these years, you can still see, if you look closely, how the, the, uh, the, the place had a similarity to a skull and picked up that name. And uh, so I might also, let me go back to that picture if I may, you'll notice up on top of the ridge, there's this, it's also a cemetery. And so that's going to be important for us to understand here in a minute. Okay, so if you look at the topology of that area, um, you realize that Mount Moriah is a ridge system. It follows that brown line roughly. At the lower end, it's about 600 meters above sea level, the city of David, but it climbs, the, the bedrock climbs higher until you get to the Temple Mount area at about 741 meters. You're still not at the peak, by the way. Most people don't realize that. If you keep following, you finally get up to 777 meters above sea level, the peak, which is north of the city. So it's a gradual rise, if you will. And uh, so that's the ridge called Mount Moriah. Now, there's a Teropian Valley between it and Mount Zion to the west. And uh, Mount Zion becomes connotative of the whole area, of course, in other passages. But there's also another valley called the Kedron Valley, uh, to the uh, we, to the uh, east of uh, Mount Moriah, and the the rise beyond that is called the Mount of Olives, and so we have that uh, that uh, topology there. Now Abraham took uh, Isaac not just to the saddle point that David will later buy for the temple, but all the way to the top, and uh, our view. And so there's a southern valley also called the Hinnom Valley, which is a city dump and constantly burning. It gives rise to the term uh, Gehenna, if you will, as an idiom or a metaphor of the end, uh, the lake that burns with fire, fire and brimstone at the end. So Salem is at the base of this um, rise. The thrashing floor of Aruna is something that David later purchases that becomes the site of the temple, but that's not at the peak. The peak is at the very, very top where we encounter the the uh, events of Genesis 22, and uh, it's something you want to read to consider all of this. Blowing this up, looking a little more uh, at a little more clearly, we have the thrashing floor of Aruna at 742 meters above sea level. We have Golgotha at 777, slightly higher. That's the peak, and uh, so that's the picture. It's interesting that all the burnt offerings and the sin offerings were to be on the north side, according to Leviticus 1 and Leviticus 6. And that's exactly where this is taking place. And uh, so it's a clean place, meaning it had to be somehow isolated from other burials, and we'll come back to that. It had to be on the north side. The burnt offerings were there, and the sin offerings there. And the, it had to be outside the camp, according to Leviticus 4 and, and uh, other passages. And without the gate, outside the gate, which Hebrews 13 so identifies it. Let's continue. Verse 18, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. Okay. They crucified him. It's astonishing to discover how thoroughly that is described in the Old Testament. As you read Psalm 22, as I say, it is so precise a description of the crucifixion that the American Medical Association has articles in it that determine the cause of death from those details. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute. And it's also described in Isaiah 53 as elegantly as, you, as putting all of Paul's epistles put together. And uh, now the crucifixion itself is complicated. There are vector tension, suffocation, it's relieved by the legs. It actually is a very, intended to be a very slow death, sometimes lasting up to nine days of torture before the person would finally die. That's where the term excruciating comes from. We use that term excruciating in the language. From the cross, crux, excruciating, it comes from that very, that very term. And so he's stripped of his clothing. He's placed on a cross. 
His nails are driven into his hands and his feet. He suffers dehydration and and intense thirst, as we'll see. And the actual death finally occurs by suffocation and the the breaking of the heart. The excruciating is from the Latin crux, if you will, from the cross itself. Something you may not understand unless you've had some geometry. There's a tension multiplier effect. As you, if you nail them on that cross, to the extent the hands are not spread, there's less, there's less strain. If you, uh, as you spread those, it increases. It's a way of increasing the leverage on the wrists, if you will. If you look at a vector diagram, as that angle gets smaller, the tension uh, is, is increased. It's a, a extreme way of increasing the pain as he hangs there. The American Medical Association has had a number of articles on this subject. Um, Due to the pain endured by the weight of the body hanging from the nails, which damage the medial nerves and tear at the tarsals, the respiratory torture, the cramping, the pleural effusions, concluded that death by crucifixion was in every sense of the word excruciating, literally, out of the cross. And that's from the March 21, 1986 rendering in the American Medical Journal, taken primarily from Psalm 22, interestingly enough. Well, then we have another thing that comes in verse 19. I find this rather fascinating. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was... Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Okay? Now, it's interesting that this is a titlon, an official title or notice that's put on here. Pilate had it on there as an official label. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. Literally, by the way, it's on the hill right off across from Damascus Gate. And it was written in three languages. It was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. It was written in Hebrew because of the Hebrew event, of course. It's Greek because that was the universal commercial language of the world at that time. And it was written in Latin because that was the official legal language of the Roman Empire. So all three languages are there. And uh, so this is apparently what Pilate wrote. And uh, in the Hebrew. Now remember, he all languages go towards Jerusalem. City, uh, nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Whether it's Hebrew, Aramaic, Sanskrit, uh, uh, Arabic, what have you. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Not only Latin and English, but obviously uh, Greek and Cyrillic and so forth. Now it's interesting, so this goes from right to left. What does it say? Yeshua, Hanatzarai, Vimelech, Ha Yehudim, Yehudim. Now, it's interesting that in English, then it's Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. You with me so far? There's something going on here that you miss unless you dig in behind it a little bit. In the next verse, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. You're saying, what, what's the difference? I'll show you the difference in a minute. But I love Pilate's answer. What I have written, I have written. So if there's a subtlety here, it's deliberate. Let's find out what that subtlety is. And... Uh, the word, by the way, it's emphatic, he said. In other words, Pilate refused to change the inscription. He, what he did here, he did very deliberately. Let's figure out what he's done. You see? His messianic proclamation has been officially acknowledged by the personal representative of the ruler of the world. Let's not lose the impact here. And this isn't casual. It's not, in, in, it's not mocking. He, this is what Pilate put there. Okay? What did he put? Well, if you look at what he wrote there, it turns, you have to understand that Hebrews are very much into alliteration, an acronym, an acronym. Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible, is an organized 
where uh, every stanza there starts with a different number. There's 22 of them, 22 Hebrew letters. Each one start every every one starts with the first the aleph, and then the next group starts with the beth, and so forth. They're into L, uh, acronyms all the way through. This happens to be a deliberate acronym on Yod Hey Vav Hey, the unpronounceable God, uh, 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 unpronounceable name of God, and. Uh, if he had written it the way they asked it, it would not have spelled out the name of God. And uh, the way he's done it here, you see, because the Yod, He, Va, He is, the, is an acronym on Yehovah or Yahweh, however you want to deal with that. And uh, they recognize that right away. Don't say it that way. They wanted it slightly changed so it wouldn't be an acronym on the name of God. And Pilate says, what I have written I have written, I don't know, I always visualize Yule Brenner saying that, if you remember how he did it in the Ten Commandments. But anyway, um, it's interesting, we're going to discover that when they take the body down and put it in the tomb, the, the chief priests go to Pilate and ask for a special guard so that the thing can't be stolen. And I love the way Pilate says, make it as sure as you can. I'm thoroughly convinced that when Pilate later hears of the empty tomb, he's not surprised. I think by then he's beginning to realize that he had more on his hands than he could possibly have dreamt of. So, now, there are people that challenge my rendering here. Because I've done this, this has been in some of our materials, and I've had some people in their blogs and stuff react to this. Well, I've had the head of the International Standard Version Foundation, Dr. William Welty, give me this to quote. He gave me permission to say this. If one were translating from Latin or Greek to Hebrew, which the soldier making the sign would need to be doing, there's a high likelihood that he would translate the Greek definite article as the Hebrew letter Vav, or add a connective that isn't in the Latin, intending that that context to make the larger phrase translate in the Hebrew Aramaic as Jesus of Nazareth, that is, King of the Jews. If the sign said this in Hebrew or Aramaic, it would generate precisely the objections noted by the Pharisees to amend the sign to read, he said that he was the King of the Jews. So I, what I'm saying is this isn't, uh, we don't know exactly what it says, what it looks like, but that that presumption is... is uh, uh, a, a defendable rendering of what we know. Well, then moving on, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And so uh, garments usually, by the way, also refer to conduct and so on. The Savior's coat was seamless, if you will, the sort of an echo of Isaiah 61, really. And remember, Adam was clothed by God. Very interesting thing in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve made coats of skins of fig leaves, and God replaced that. They were clothed by God, teaching them by the death of an innocent they would be covered. That, that, that rabbinical teaching starts in Genesis 3 and echoes all the way through the Torah. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it. That is this un, un, a seamless note. Let's not rend it. Let's cast lots for it. Whose it shall be? You see, we know there's four of them. They divide it into four parts, right? But here's something that's too valuable to tear apart. So let's, you know, they threw lots for it. So we say, if they parted, and, and, and so that, let's cast lots for it. Those it shall be. Now notice what uh, John tells us here. That the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. And these things the soldiers did. Now, I don't think, the fact that they parted my raiment among them, so I don't think the soldiers realized they were acting out a prophecy. This was specified in Psalm 22, verse 18. And let me tell you, frankly, if we, if we could spend the whole hour just on Psalm 22, digging out the incredible treasures that are tucked into that from beginning to end. I'll let you do that on your own. Let's go to verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. Those are four women. 
There were four soldiers in the cross dividing his clothes. There are four women here. And uh, notice it's interesting that um, Jesus assigns his mother to the, John the Apostle, not to any of his brothers. Cleopas, his wife is here. Cleopas will show up Sunday afternoon on the way to Emmaus. We'll see that uh, in that in our in that uh, as we look at the post-resurrection appearances. We're also going to discover, by the way, that John will later settle in Ephesus after the Patmos experience. He settles in Ephesus, writes this gospel. But the second epistle of John, it's amazing to me how many, how few people recognize that the second epistle of John is a personal letter of John to Mary, Jesus' mother. And you, if you look very, very carefully, you can demonstrate that from the text itself. And uh, it even has a reference, by the way, to M Mary's sister, which is referenced here. So that echoes, she's mentioned here, uh, she's at the foot of the cross, and she's also alluded into in, in John's letter to them. So these two groups are contrasted. We have four soldiers, and we have four ministering women. Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Cleopas, the one that's going to be on the Emmaus Road later, Mary the mother of Jesus, of course, and finally her sister, the sister of, of uh, Mary the mother of Jesus. Probably Joseph's sister, we assume. We don't know. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, who is that? John. That's a term that John uses of himself. And the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. In other words, he's assigning John in that role to take his place there. Because his relationship with her, her is severed, in effect. The law required the firstborn to provide for parents. And he is transferring that responsibility to the apostle John. Not his half-brothers, if you will. Mary did have other children, as listed in Matthew 13, and, and uh, is alluded to in Psalm 69, by the way. But it's interesting, even in his agony... Christ is on that cross. Even in his agony, we see his shepherd's heart providing for all of this. Behold your son. Jesus was her son no longer. Mary is not mentioned in connection with Christ's resurrection. There's one appearance, in, a subtle appearance in Acts, and then she disappears from the record. Then he saith to the disciple, that he says this, then he addresses this to John, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And that's exactly what John did do. He retires in Ephesus and Mary uh, with him there. And the per St. John is a personal letter to her, actually. And so, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. That's exactly what Psalm 69 predicted. And is, here he is from that extreme dehydration pleading for a drink of something. It's interesting there are 28 prophecies fulfilled just while he's hanging on the cross. And I'll let you search those out on your own. Psalm 22, Genesis 22, Isaiah 53, and Leviticus 16 are a good beginning. I'll let you dig those out. I thirst, he says. This is the one that balanced the clouds, that fills the mighty deep, who guides every river in its course, waters in the fields, he that caused the water to flow from the smitten rock in the wilderness, who turned water into wine, and said to the woman of Samaria, Give me to drink, is here saying, I thirst. The King of kings and Lord of lords, before whom hell trembles, and the earth is filled with dismay. Matchless condescension, condescension from the infinity of God to the weakness of a thirsty, dying man. And this was all for who? For you and me. For you and me. There's another dimension to this that doesn't often come up. But those of you guys who are fathers, I think you can visualize situations where your own son might be rushed to an emergency ward covered with blood because of some accident or some encounter. And you know how you would immediately, if you could, trade places with him. You are more jealous of his welfare than you are for your own. With that kind of a 
perspective. There's an atmosphere that most people miss. Clearly, Jesus is undergoing huge, huge trauma here in the crucifixion. But while all this is going on, it's astonishing to recognize how God the Father is dealing with all of this. That he's allowing his son to be spit upon, to be mocked, to be tortured, and, and tortured to death, and not interfering. The love that Jesus has for us as he hangs on the cross is pretty obvious to any of us who have thought about that a bit. The love of the Father allowing that to run its course for our benefit is a testimony to his love for us that we often overlook. Love in the extreme indeed. Love in the extreme indeed. Now there was a vessel, uh, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with the vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it into his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, the term translated, it is finished, in the Greek is tetelestai. And it's translated, it is finished here. It could just as easily be translated, paid in full. And Paul makes a development of that in Colossians chapter 2 that you may want to put in your notes and check it, you know, check it through. And uh, I'll also remind you what Jesus said back uh, in chapter 10 where Jesus told his disciples, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father, he declares there. And we're going to discover that Pilate will be surprised that he died so quickly. This was all designed to be... That's why they went to go break the legs and all that, because they had to speed it up. But he find that, that find that, that, that Jesus has already died. The moment of his death is the moment of our salvation. Our justification was nailed right there. And uh, he did it all. We can't add to what he did. To even try is blasphemy. Paid in full. Done. There is nothing left for you and I to do regarding our justification. He's done it all. It was all settled 2,000 years ago on a wooden cross in Judea. So he gave up the spirit. He willingly and deliberately surrendered his life as, John, as he described he would in John 10. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, that is the preparation of the coming Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, it was a high a sabbaton. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. In other words, they didn't want it prolonged. They want them dead so they could be taken down before the holiday. And so that's the, that's the, the so the Sabbath day was a high day. It's a Sabbaton. It's one of the seven Sabbaths in addition to the so-called Saturdays. This one was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with them. They, ki they broke the legs of the other two. They didn't break his legs because he was already dead, but they didn't break them for another reason that they were not aware of. It was prophesied that not a leg the, of the Passover lamb, not a leg would be broken. They've just committed judicial murder, but they were concerned about observing the ritual law. Now, Jesus declared that he would be in the grave three days to the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits is the, is the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. So it's always a Sunday morning. So he had to be in the grave that day to fulfill the specifications. The enemies of God are unknowingly fulfilling God's counsels. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs. The bones were not broken. The soldier didn't follow his instructions. He didn't know it, but the Passover lamb was not to have a bone broken. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came, there came out blood and water. There are rabbinical writings speculate they don't know why it is on Passover 
that the Jews add a little warm water to the wine. They have rabbinical papers that they speculate on why they do that. They're not sure why they do that. It's a tradition. Well, the tradition's explained right here. Came about blood and water. Passover wine mixed with warm water. The blood speaks of justification, and the water speaks of sanctification. And there's that something though, that distinction you need to study and understand, and we won't try to take our time to do it here. The cause of death was a ruptured or broken heart, according to Psalm 69, verse 20. It's interesting that the first Adam had Eve taken out of his side, and many people think there's a type of the church implied here in terms of the last Adam and his act of justification. And he that saw it bear record, his record is true, and he knoweth that he, that he saith it's true, that ye might believe. That's John's undergirding here, and he's going to echo that again in the next chapter. For these things were done, that the Scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Okay? There are at least three of these. Exodus 12:46. In one house shall be eaten, the speaking of the Passover lamb. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. That's in Exodus 12, where the Passover is being instituted in Egypt. Okay. In Numbers 9, verse 12, speaking of the Passover observation, They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinance of the Passover, shall, they shall keep it. It's interesting in these rules about observing the Passover, we have this emphasis that not a bone will be broken. Psalm 34, verse 20, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. That's told of the Messiah. But then in the next verse, John adds something else that's kind of interesting. He says, again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. This little allusion by John is an unusual one because it hasn't been fulfilled yet. John's making a reference here, and if you do a concordance about looking upon whom they pierced, you're led to Zechariah 12.10. But that hasn't happened yet. Let's take, this has not happened. Uh, Zechariah 12.10. And uh, in chapter 9 and 10, to give you the flavor here of Zechariah 12, Zechariah writes, And I will pour upon the house, or I should say God says through Zechariah, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And then verse 10 says, And they shall look upon me, the one whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, it's very interesting, the way they translate this in the Masoretic is an error. And uh, Dr. William Welty has written a 35-page paper on the erroneous and inconsistent rendering of Et Asher there uh, in the Jewish publication, Sotai's 1917 publication of the Tanakh. The 158 other occurrence argue against the traditional Jewish re rendering because they have thrust them through. In other words, if you look this up in the in the uh, Jewish rendering, you'll notice that they've twisted a little to hide this. They shall look upon me, the one whom they have pierced, is what it says, and the experts nail that uh, scholastically. It gets even better, by the way, because if you take the trouble to look at this verse in the Hebrew, uh, in this place where they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, between the me and the one whom they pierced, there are two little letters that are not translated. Uh, there's an Aleph and a Tau. Remember, they go backwards. The Aleph's on the right and the Tau on the left. Aleph and the Tau. Now, that Aleph and the Tau, if it's connected with the Degesh, can be used to indicate a direct... It has about four uses in grammar. But that's not connected this way. It's floating there, untranslated. If that was... The, the Greek equivalent would be... See, this. Uh, they look upon me, the Aleph and the Tau, whom they've pierced. If I do that in Greek, it'll ring more familiar. They shall look upon me, the Alpha and the Omega, whom they've pierced. In the book of Revelation, those are titles that Jesus, in the Greek, takes of himself. The Aleph and the Tau is used that way right here in Zechariah 12, verse 9 and 10. And uh, the, uh, there are people that will take exception, but there are people that are in the mi minority, they're, they're not in the know. That is, that is, not, that is 
um, an untranslated pair of letters. And you find those several places in the scripture where it speaks of Elohim. Elohim, the Aleph and the Tau, the beginning and the end. So I think that's kind of fun. But moving on, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. And he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Now, there, this is quite. A, there, there's a lot that we can draw from this verse. The fact that Joseph Arimathea had direct access to Pilate tells you a couple of things. He was not a casual guy. He's one of the wealthiest people in the area. He's the one that uh, apparently owned the property for the garden tomb and all of that, right next to Golgotha. And uh, uh, he also apparently was the next of kin because he would have. That's what that would he would have the claim on the body being the next of kin. Um, it says a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. That's a mistranslation. Secretly. The way it's translated implies that's an adverb. That's a mistake. In the Greek, it turns out it's secreted, not secretly. It's an adjective because of just one letter difference that was missed by the translators. He was secreted. He wasn't just secretly a believer. He was in hiding. He was undercover. He was secreted. That's why when he surfaces here, Pilate's surprised. Okay? It's for anyway, a number of reasons. But I remember Chuck Smith from his pulpit when Easter pointed out that uh, Pilate was really shocked. He turned to Joseph, Joseph Arimathea and he says, You're going to, you have this brand new tomb, never been used for your family and so on, and you're going to give it to this criminal? And Joe says, Oy vey, it's just for the weekend. <laughs> a little levity, a little levity, okay. I remember when Chuck did that on Easter morning, I couldn't believe he'd do it. It's a chuckle, of course, but to do it from the public, from the pulpit on, on Easter morning. The tomb we know belonged to a rich man from a number of passages. It was near the crucifixion location, John tells us. It had never been used before. It was a brand new sepulcher, we know. It was hewn out of the rock. It had to be to separate it from any other graves, so it would be considered a clean place, uh, the Levitically. And they had a stone rolled over the door, Mark tells us. There's actually 18 details in the text that supports the idea that's fulfilled by the garden tomb. And I'll come to that in a minute. But in any case, let's finish this uh, verse 39 here. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Remember that back in John 3? And brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And uh, so these spices are, uh, there's about a hundred pounds of these spices. That's uh, a lot. And the women who witnessed this burial returned home to prepare the spices and ointments to finish the procedure later. Luke gives us those details. But here's a John, but John gives us a little more. He says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In other words, the garden is where, near Golgotha. It's right next door. It's right there. And in the garden, a new sepulcher there, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher, was nigh at hand. You with me so far? Okay? And he brought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, laid him in the sepulcher, which was hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone unto the, unto the door of the sepulcher. This is from Mark 15, the quote here. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of uh, Joseph, beheld where he was laid. He, the place was hewn out of a rock, rolled a stone. The, these, this is all out of the text, interestingly enough. Okay. It's interesting. I uh, when I was doing the, uh, my studies in the book of Leviticus, I uh, obtained a copy of the book, the commentary on Leviticus by Andrew Bonar. It's a classic, published in 1846, and he makes a lot of uh, he makes quite a presentation in the text of Leviticus. The very spot that criminals were put to death was where Joseph's new tomb was hewn out of a rock. The stony sides of the tomb, the new tomb, the clean place where Jesus was laid, were part of the malefactor's hill. His dead body is 
with the rich man and the wicked in the hour of his death, just as Isaiah 53 predicted. His grave is the property of a rich man, and yet the rocks which form the partition between his tomb and that of the other Calvary malefactors are themselves part of Golgotha. In other words, by being carved out of the thing, that specification was uh, uh, imperative. I want you to notice the date of his commentary where he's describing the tomb as it comes out of the text, the biblical text. Okay? If you visit the garden tomb in Jerusalem, it's usually, it's usually the highlight of your visit to actually be there at the, what they call the garden tomb. And it's interesting how the details of this are described by Bonar just from the Torah text 37 years before this space was discovered by General Gordon. They call it Gordon's Travel. Actually, General Charles Go uh, George Gordon was a distinguished British general commissioned second lieutenant in 1852. He discovered the area, originally derisively called Gordon's Calvary, which is now known as the Garden Tomb. He discovered that in 1883. But what really struck me when I checked my commentary from Bonar is that he described this just from the biblical text in 1846, in fact before that, 37 years before its discovery by General Gordon. I think that's very, very provocative. And uh, people, some people say, well, that's just Gordon's view. No, uh, there's, a, there's a number of ways it seems to fit the text perfectly. So there are, many, there are many sites in Israel that you visit that are traditional. And I believe that most of the traditions are wrong. There are a few things you can count on. You know the Sea of Galilee is the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Well, I also happen to hold, it doesn't mean I'm right, but just for what it's worth to you, I, am, uh, I have studied this quite a bit, and I personally am convinced that the, the garden tomb is the tomb that Jesus laid in because of its fitting the text. There's at least over 18 ways it specifically fits the situation for what it's worth. And uh, there are other people with different views. And then we have, uh, in Matthew 27, we'll pick up a little description here. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people he is risen from the dead, so the last error will be worse than the first. Interesting comment. They admit it was a mistake. That's kind of fun. They also are aware of the three days. You know, the disciples weren't. They remembered it later when it happened. They tied it all together. But it's interesting how the, 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 the enemies of Christ are sensitive to that. They recognize there's a hazard to them here. I love what Pilate said to them. He said unto them, You have your watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. I love that. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, stealing the stone and, uh, stealing the stone and uh, setting a watch. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, stealing the stone and setting a watch. I personally hear an echo in Pilate's voice it causes me to suspect that when he later finds out that the tomb is empty, he wasn't surprised. I think it's gradually dawning on him that this is something, there's more at issue here than he had any ability to grasp. So make it as sure as you can. I love that. I personally suspect, I don't know, obviously, um, I suspect that Pilate may be in heaven when we get there. There are legends in the, among the Coptics in Egypt that he did come to faith later. He went to Rome and got fired over some issues. And, uh, uh, there, the, but the tradition, there's no clear documentary evidence either way, plus or minus. We don't know. But uh, Jesus arrived at Golgotha. He refused the offer of wine, ver vinegar, and myrrh. He was nailed across between the two thieves. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then we have the garments allocated. The Jews mock Jesus. And uh, darkness from noon to 3 p.m. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I am thirsty. And then he drank the wine vinegar. And he said, it is finished, paid in full, and so on. And uh, so I cry, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gives up the ghost. 
And it's that point that the temple curtain is torn in twain. And the Roman soldiers themselves declare, surely he was the Son of God. And uh, there were seven cries from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today thou shalt be with me in Paris, he says to the, uh, the, 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 the saved one of the two. Woman, behold thy son, and behold thy mother, when he con con consigns Mary's care to John. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Of course, is his cry, and I thirst, and to tell us I. And finally, Father, into thy hands I commit my, sp my spirit. I'm very impressed with Salvador Dali's rendering of Corpus Christi. I was stunned to discover that Salvador Dali was enough of a mathematician to realize that this is a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional event. That he understood what a, a, a tesseract is, a four-dimensional a four cube unraveled in three dimensions. That's a very sophisticated issue mathematically. I was fascinated that he, ada he, he adapted that for his rendering of this issue. The Old Testament prophecies, quote, just the ones quoted in the Gospels, that he'd make a triumphal entry in Jerusalem, he'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver, he would be smitten like a shepherd, he would be given vinegar and gall, they would cast lots for his garments, his side would be pierced. All this is quoted in the Gospels from the, from the uh, Old Testament. And... Uh, not a bone would be broken. We've covered that. Would die among malefactors. His dying words were foretold. He would be buried by a rich man. He would rise from the dead the third day. We'll cover that in our next session. And uh, the resurrection would be, would be followed by a, the destruction of Jerusalem. And indeed it was, 38 years later. So we have... The summary, he was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. What held him to that cross? It wasn't the nails. At any time he could have said, enough, I'm out of here. It, what held him to that cross was his love for you and me. And as we try to embrace this, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, but it's important that we do. Now, next time, we're not, we're not, we're not going to leave you with, a, with a, a, a crucified Christ. We, want to, we, we worship a resurrected Christ. So ne in the next session, we're going to deal with the resurrection, the most phenomenal validation of everything that's going on here. And I'm going to encourage you to read not only John 20, chapter this next, but Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, those are the last chapters in each of those Gospels. Read all four of them so we can really get our mind around the issue. Now, if you're wondering where I got that picture, that's a picture of the garden tomb in the middle of the night before the, roll, the stone was lost. And uh, once you to discover Photoshop, you won't trust any picture you see again. <laughs> okay. But anyway, also 1 first, first Corinthians 15. You might take a look at what Paul suggests is the most essential epistle uh, chapter in the Bible, which really, of course, elaborates on the resurrection. So with that, let's stand for a closing.